Good morning, church. Good morning. Hosea 10, 1 through 12. Israel is a luxuriant vine that yields its fruits. The more his fruit is the more his fruit increased, the more altars he built. As his country improved, he improved his pillars. Their heart is false. Now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will break down their altars and destroy their pillars. For now they will say, we have no king, for we do not fear the Lord. And a king, what could he do for us? They utter mere words with empty oaths. They make covenants. So judgment springs up like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. The inhabitants of Samaria tremble for the calf of beth Aven. Its people mourn for it, and so does its idolatrous priests, those who rejoice over it and over its glory, for it has departed from them. The thing itself shall be carried to Assyria and tribute to the king. Ephraim shall be put to shame, and Israel shall be ashamed of his idol. Samaria's king shall perish like a twig on the face of the waters. The high places of Avon, the sin of Israel shall be destroyed. Thorn and thistle shall grow up on their altars, and they shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. From the days of Gibeah you have sinned, O Israel, O Israel there they have continued. Shall not, to the war, shall not the war against the unjust overtake them in Gabea? When, when I please, I will discipline them, and nations shall be gathered against them. When they are bound up for their double iniquity, Ephraim was a trained calf that loved to thresh, and I spared her fair neck. But I will put Ephraim to the yoke, Judah must plow, Jacob must harrow for himself. Sow for yourselves righteousness. righteousness. Reap steadfast love, break up your fallow ground. For it is the time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. This is the word of our Lord. Good morning, everyone. Good to have you here. My name is Mark, and I serve as the adult ministries pastor. And if you're here somewhere in the building or you're online watching, we're really glad you're with us this morning. And to begin our time together, I want to tell you a story, but it requires imagination on your part. Are you ready for that? Are you feeling imaginative this morning? Maybe you're imagining that I'm Ray right now, and that's why you came. But anyway, we'll, we'll go with this. So here's the story. Uh, a married couple is driving home, so you have to envision that this is the front seat of a car. And this married couple is driving home after just celebrating with their family their 60th wedding anniversary. Give it up for the imaginary couple. Yeah. 60 years together. Maybe they shouldn't be driving home, but that's not part of the story. And so this mature, seasoned couple is driving home, and as they're heading home, staring straight ahead, the wife begins to reminisce, and she begins to remember what it was like in the early days of their relationship, and she begins to share stories. Do you remember when we first met? Do you remember some of our first dates? Do you remember when, in those days, we had a vehicle that, if some of you in the room might remember, there used to be almost like a bench in the front, not a console in the middle, but you could sit all the way across, and probably illegally put as many people in the front seat as you wanted to. And she said, do you remember? I would scoot all the way over and sit right next to you, and it looked almost as if there was one body with two heads, and you would have one hand on the steering wheel and one hand around me. And we would drive for hours, and we would talk for hours. Now I sit way over here, and we both stare straight ahead, no words are spoken. What happened? She asked. What happened? And the husband, continuing to stare straight ahead and drive down the road, said, Well, honey, you're the one who slid over. I'm where I've been for over 60 years. 
We're not sure if he made it home that night. (laughs) But this story illustrates a fairly sad but common occurrence that at times, a love that at one time was very vibrant and alive has now slowly over time grown distant and cold. And if you've been with us for any of our series that we're currently on in the book of Hosea, perhaps you've picked up on that metaphor, that in many ways this describes God's relationship with Israel at the time of Hosea's life, that there was once a vibrant love that was alive, but now it's grown cold and it's become distant and they've drifted apart. And so as we go into our section this morning on the book of Hosea, we're going to see that unfold before us, that this relationship has drifted. And so God is calling his people back to their first love. In a sense, for our time this morning, we're going to say, God is asking Israel to slide back over, to slide back over. And so here's our setup. If you have your notes with you, uh, if you have a bulletin, or you can always go on the U version and look up our church, you can find the notes there. Uh, We began it this way. These chapters we're in right now, Hosea 4 through 10, and we're concluding chapter 10 today. These chapters contain a collection of Hosea's prophetic poetry. And we're detailing the causes and effects of Israel's unfaithfulness as a covenant partner. Now, you may not have known this, but the majority of the book of Hosea is poetry. Hosea is a poet. And when I think of a poet, certain things come to mind. And sometimes poetry looks like this. If I can get this out, it's stuck in a pocket. Here we go, here we go. Now we're ready. Roses are red. Violets are blue. I wrote this poem just for you. I highly doubt that's Hosea's poetry. But that's what I think of when I think of poetry. Or maybe this image comes to mind. Probably not for you, but for some people I know. Yes, that is me in a cow suit during my days at Northwest Christian as a teacher. (laughs) At times, I would do a little thing where I would put on a cow suit, and I was the cow poet. And I would write and recite poetry from the mind of a cow. (laughs) Needless to say, those poems were very moving. (laughs) And yes, that's utterly ridiculous. No, uh, Hosea's poetry was much more sincere and much more realistic and not full of this goofiness. Hosea's poetry was, and and Hebrew poetry in general is maybe something we're not familiar with. It was more free verse, rarely did it rhyme, often the lines would be balanced, there'd be a parallelism to it. But primarily for our efforts this morning, one thing that helps us is to know that Hebrew poetry is filled with symbolism and allusion and figures of speech that, quite frankly, you and I don't have in our normal daily life. I mean, we're talking about a man writing in a time period 2,700 years before us, in a land that's about 7,500 miles away, using the region, the lifestyle, the politics, and the religious practices of the day. And so while we may not quite understand what Hosea is saying, and it takes a little bit of digging, we can, if we do that digging, we can see that Hosea's poetry reveals deep, timeless truths about God's character and about our human nature. So although we weren't alive and living in Israel as Hosea wrote this poetry, and oh, by the way, about 50% of the Old Testament is in poetic form. 
we can, if we do the proper digging, and we spend a little time understanding words and figures of speech and some of the locations that Hosea mentions, we can really gain some insight for ourselves today. And we're going to try to answer two simple questions by looking at the second half of chapter 9 and all of chapter 10 this morning. We first want to see what does it look like when someone rejects their first love, and then hopefully on the back end, see what does it look like, what will it take to remember your first love. Now, if you uh, are just with us for the first time this morning, glad to have you here, or if you've been in and out and you're wondering, I'm not sure what Hosea is, that sounds like one of those Old Testament books that nobody ever reads. Let me give you a quick little update and uh, a little overview of our book of Hosea, and it's in your notes as well. Hosea was a prophet, and at this time, Israel has been split into two sections. After Solomon, the, the, the country split, and there's a northern kingdom called Israel, and there's a southern kingdom that calls itself Judah. If we were to use the room in front of us this morning, and for all of you, this is north, everyone from this side of the pole to this direction, you are the pagan northern country of Israel. Congratulations. It's no accident that Nathan is sitting on that side. <laughs> on this section over here is the southern country of Judah that at times had better, more God-fearing kings, but for the most part, your days are numbered also. <laughs> but in Israel at this time, we have 200 years after Solomon and 750 years before Jesus, a very, very intense time for someone who chooses to follow God, and those individuals were rare because Hosea was living in a time where there were disobedient kings. All 19 kings in the northern section of Israel failed to recognize God and follow him. A perfect 19 for 19 rejected God. Widespread idolatry, as Pastor Ray spoke to us about in the last couple of weeks. And also something that you may not have known is that there's a, actually a significant amount of wealth in the northern kingdom of Israel at this time as well, and that will play into some of their unwillingness to recall their first love because they're doing pretty well financially at this stage in their existence. And then as we saw in the first three chapters, if you were around at the beginning of our study, uh, those chapters are dedicated to Hosea's actual life in which God calls him to marry a prostitute named Gomer and use Hosea's life as an example of what it means to remain faithful when your partner is unfaithful. And for 25 years, for 25 years, Hosea preaches and writes to the kingdom of Israel. And his poems, which sometimes is why we, if you're struggling to understand Hosea, it's because about every three or four verses is a brand new poem written over 25 years and then cobbled together and put into one volume. But within those poems, there are two themes that we see over and over and over again. The first one is that there is judgment. God is going to bring judgment because of Israel's rebellion. And when Hosea lives, it's pretty close. It's within a decade or two after Hosea's life that the judgment comes in Assyria attacking from the north and taking Israel. But the second theme that Hosea comes back to time and time again is God's love and mercy. That's more powerful than their rebellion. And there's always these hints throughout the book that there is a restoration coming for Israel. There's a time coming for them. And we even see uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, many, many, even thousands of years ago, after that time of deportation, that God did let Israel come back into the land. And so as we go through these chapters, just one more quick reminder, then we'll jump into the text this morning, that because Hosea is speaking in a very different language to a very different people group, it can be difficult to decipher. And I love what uh, the Old Testament professor John Walton is known for saying. Uh, he stated this. He said, the Bible, it's written for us, but it's not written to us. We're not the original audience, and so we're smart to take some time to try to understand what the original audience would sense as they heard or read this. And then we can take that and pull out timeless truths that will then apply to us today. So studying the immediate cultural context can really help. And so we'll walk through some of that this morning, uh, and hopefully it'll make the passage come a little more alive 
for you. So here we go. In chapters 4 through 10, Hosea returns again and again to three primary accusations against Israel because of their unfaithfulness. And here's the first one. The first thing that God really is accusing Israel of, and He does this multiple times throughout the text, is that they are absent in their relationship with God. Another way to say this would be that almost quoting God here, He said it to this extent, is that you don't know me, Israel. You don't know me. There's an absence of relationship now. The drift has occurred. What was once... A close, intimate relationship has now slowly drifted away. And 19 times in Hosea's book, he mentions the idea that they don't know God anymore. 19 times either the word know or knowledge or acknowledge appears in the text. And we're going to show a few of them to you this morning. They'll be up on the screen. Uh, If you want to pop around through your Bible, you can, but they'll be up there as well. Uh, This section, this second section of Hosea, began in chapter 4 after the first three chapters of Hosea's personal life. And the very first words in chapter 4, the first poem that Hosea writes, he says this, Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love. And then this next line, in many ways, is the thesis of the rest of the book. And no knowledge of God in the land. There's no knowledge of God in the land. Pop down a couple verses to chapter 4, verse 6. And here, Hosea is specifically targeting his words at the leadership, the spiritual leadership in Israel at the time. And God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And then you priests, you religious leaders, because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you've forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Chapter 5, verse 4, their deeds do not permit them to return to their God. For the spirit of whoredom is within them, and they know not the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 3, in this case, Hosea is envisioning a future for Israel. Like, what if Israel repented? What if they resought their first love? And Hosea writes this, let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out as sure as the dawn, He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. And then the last one I'll share with you is is from last week. Pastor Ray talked about this in Hosea chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. And this is Israel in a cry of desperation, trying to almost convince themselves that they do know God, because it says, to me they cry, my God, we, Israel, we we know you, we know you. But Israel has spurned the good, the enemy shall pursue him. And this word know or knowledge that pops up again and again and again in Hosea's writings, it's a specific word in the Hebrew language. It's the word yada, yada. Now, in our cultural context that we live in right now, you see that word three times in a row, and everyone says, yada, yada, yada. That's not what it means here. We're not yada, yada, yadding someone off from the conversation, but yada in Hebrew is a special type of knowledge. It's a knowledge that's based on experience. There's relationship involved. You see, it's more than just accumulating intellectual facts about something. It's developing relationship with someone. In my teens and early 20s, I had a particular fascination. Uh, it, It became pretty important to me. And that is, I was a huge fan of the basketball player Michael Jordan. Arguably the greatest basketball player of all time. You may think someone else is better than Michael Jordan, We can have that discussion. You'll be wrong, but we can have that discussion. And MJ was like the guy for me. I knew everything about Michael Jordan. I knew that his sophomore year in high school, he got cut from the varsity team, and that got him really inspired to become better. He also grew like six inches, which, what's that like? I don't know. Anyway, 
And then he starred in high school, went on to play at the University of North Carolina as a freshman in 1982. He hit the game-winning shot in the national championship game with 17 seconds left to beat Georgetown. I have a picture of that shot. It's an old black and white picture. It's the uh, screensaver on my computer at home still to this day. He went on to be drafted by the Chicago Bulls. With them, he won six NBA championships. Each time, he was the championship MVP. Five times, he was the regular season MVP. 14 times, he was an all-star. Twice, he won the Olympics. He made Nike famous. And when I was during these formative ages, I had on a wall in my apartment, especially in college and after college, I had a wall that had every poster, every magazine cover, every quote of Michael Jordan. It was a shrine to Michael Jordan. And then I met my future wife, Melissa. And she said to me very nicely, it's time to be an adult. <laughs> and so I rolled up my posters and gave them to current students at the time, and so my blessing became their blessing. Now, I knew Michael Jordan, but I didn't. Yada, Michael Jordan, I never met him. I was never in the same building with him. I just saw him from a distance. And I had a lot of facts accumulated and a lot of posters accumulated. But I didn't know him, I never experienced life with him. And this in many ways is what Israel thinks about themselves right now. They're saying, oh, we know God, sure. We know all about you, God. In fact, we still participate in the rituals and the sacrifices and the feasts that you set up under Moses hundreds of years before. But they weren't experiencing God. They were not yada-ing God. Because we all know that developing a relationship, that's incremental investments over time. Yada never happens overnight. And so if their relationship with God had drifted, it's because over time they ceased wanting to know Him, and they just had intellectual facts about Him. And so throughout the letter that Hosea writes, throughout these poems that he puts down to pen, he says basically, God wants His people to know Him to know him the way he knows them. He wants relationship. He desires intimacy with his people. And they have drifted, and they have slid over. So their intellectual knowledge is not matched with an experiential knowledge. And so God says, I just want my people to know me. So that's the beginning of the drift, the not knowing God in a yada way. Now, our text this morning is really going to hit hard the second and the third accusations. Uh, that was kind of a, a warm-up to everything that we've seen up to this point. Now, Hosea is really going to lay into the next two accusations. The second accusation that we're going to see in chapter 9 and a little bit in chapter 10 is the nation of Israel is also very hypocritical in their worship. They'd become hypocrites in their worship. Or another way to say this is to say that God looks at his Israel and says, you pretend to connect with me. You pretend to connect with me. Because you don't know me anymore, because you've drifted, now when there's an attempt at connecting with me, it really is just a bunch of pretense. Israel's just a bunch of fakers and posers when it comes to their religious practice. And to help Israel catch the understanding of this. Hosea does something that often we see in the prophetic books of the Old Testament, is that he takes Israel back to previous experiences. He calls back to former times in Israel's history to demonstrate this hypocrisy in worship. In Hosea 9.10, the very beginning of this section we're looking at this morning, this is what uh, Hosea writes, like grapes in the wilderness, speaking on behalf of God. He says, like grapes in the wilderness, God says, I found Israel. Like the first fruit on the fig tree in its first season, I saw your fathers. But they came to Baal Peor, 
Baal Peor, and they consecrated themselves to the thing of shame. Baal Peor, the thing of shame, and became detestable like the thing they loved. Now, let's be honest. You and I, if we're reading through Hosea, we get to that. Most of us don't even try to pronounce it correctly. I just, huh, 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 and move on, and that's understandable. But if you do a little digging, take a moment, like, Baal Peor. What happened at Baal Peor? If you go back into the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 25, Moses and the Israelites are in the wilderness. Remember, they're wandering because of their disobedience. And in the wanderings in chapter 25, they arrive at a place called Peor. And in Numbers 25, we read that at Peor, they encounter some Moabites and Midianites who are worshiping the false god Baal. And in this moment, we read in Numbers 25 that the people of Israel were so fascinated and encaptured by this worship that they began to worship Baal themselves. And specifically, we read in Numbers 25 that the men of Israel began to interact with the women of Moab and Midian and involved in their fertility rites. Hosea mentions Baal Peor because in a, in a mind of a person living in Israel at that time, they immediately jump back to, oh yes, Numbers 25. And this is when the pattern began. This is the first of many times when the nation of Israel slips into idol worship, slips into false god practices, slips into mixing together the worship of God with the worship of some other foreign god. Baal Peor is code in the Jewish mind for, oh yeah, I remember that. Look at Hosea 9.9, one verse before it. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. Mm, That's another reference. What's Gibeah? He will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. One chapter later in Hosea 10.9, same statement. From the days of Gibeah, you have sinned, O Israel. There they have continued. Shall not the war against the unjust overtake them in Gibeah? So then again, you're like, well, what's happening in Gibeah? Why does Hosea mention Gibeah twice in back-to-back chapters? If you go into Judges, chapter 19, the last two chapters of Judges specifically, this story in Judges 19 is in many ways the most horrific story you can find in the Old Testament. The VeggieTale guys did not make an episode on Judges 19. (laughs) In this story, and we will paint it as as quickly as we possibly can, but it is, it's pretty amazingly vulgar. Uh, A Levite is traveling with a concubine, and they spend the night at a man's house right outside the city of Gibeah. And much like the Sodom and Gomorrah story, men from Gibeah come to the house, and they want to interact with the visitors of the house. Only in this case, this Levite priest gives his concubine to the men, and throughout the night, they assault her and they kill her. And it actually begins a civil war in Israel. This man takes her body and sends it to the tribes, and the tribe of Benjamin is almost destroyed in this. And at the end of Judges, we read what is really the key at that moment in time in Israel's history, that there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Gibeah is code for the most eh moment in Israel history. It's cringeworthy. It's known throughout history as the darkest time in Israel's history. God is pulling out all the stops to get his covenant people to come back. And he has Hosea bring up two of the darkest spots in Israel's history, the low points, the most embarrassing things that they could possibly imagine from their ancestry. Theologians and sociologists have a, have a term for this, what's happening here in Israel, and it's called syncretism. You've heard that term before, syncretism. It deals with the mixing of religion with the cultural practices and rituals of the day. And so you allow the cultural ideas and some of the trends that are happening in your culture to infiltrate into your religious practices. So you can't even really tell the difference anymore. 
And specifically what Israel was doing at the time of Hosea is they, again, were looking at Canaanite religious practices and mixing them in with the worship of their Yahweh God. Because in this time period, everyone, uh, idol worship in many ways was their technology. Like, this is how they thought they got the crops to grow. And if worshiping one God might be good, worshiping other gods might even be better. So to cover all their bases, praise the God of Israel and Baal. Because if I worship all of them, perhaps the crops will grow and perhaps we will be safe and affluent. Israel keeps God's wedding ring on their finger while they are unfaithful with other gods. And they think it's working. And so the response is that by going through the motions, they're pretty confident that this will create the false illusion that everything is fine. And in chapter 9, verses 11 through the beginning of chapter 10, if you go back and look at that, you'll see a lot of imagery used to denote infertility. Uh, Jose uses terms like dried up. He even mentions miscarriage, no fruit, death, exile. They had failed to remember that worship isn't about what I get from God. Worship is about who God is. Worship isn't transactional. And they were using the worship of all the gods, and let's mix them all together to get the best out of life. And all God really wants is He wants His people to be real with Him. He wants His people to be real with Him. First accusation was that they just do not know me anymore, God said. There's no relationship, and all I really want you to do is to know me. Secondly, they were faking their religious experience with God, and all God really wants is for them to be real with Him. The third accusation is that they were also relying on foreign nations, or, as God would perhaps say it, you pursue someone other than me. You pursue someone other than me. You don't really know me. You pretend to worship me. And so the third domino to fall is you pursue someone other than me. A couple verses out of Hosea chapter 10 point this out to us. Hosea 10 verse 10, when I please, I will discipline them. I will gather nations together to attack them, to bind them in chains for their two sins. A few verses later in 14 and 15, the roar of battle will rise against your people. It's coming. Attack is on its way. All your fortresses will be devastated. And again, here's a reference to something out of Israel's history that would cause them to perk up, just as Shalman devastated Beth Arbel on the day of battle. Lots of interesting ideas as to what might this be describing. It may have been an earlier Assyrian attack. It may be something that happened in another part of the country. Uh, there really isn't a consensus among theologians, but we know that Israel knew what that meant, and we can see a little bit of the fallout of whatever this devastation was because the next line says, when mothers were dashed to the ground with their children, so this will happen to you, O Bethel, because of your great wickedness. When that day dawns, the king of Israel will be destroyed. At this moment in time, Israel has made political alliances with Assyria to the north and Egypt to the south. And they did it for a couple reasons. There's a lot of political protection from two big superpowers that are above you and below you. But also it creates a really nifty trade route up and through the Israeli country. And so that's how Israel was gaining affluence at the time, is multiple people coming in and out of their country, trading between Assyria and Egypt. And so the Israeli kings kept making more and more treaties and alliances with Assyria and Egypt. It even visually, it shows you how divided Israel was. They were making compromises to the north and the south in both directions. And God says through Hosea, those alliances are going to backfire because there's a time coming when the nations that you think are providing military protection are actually going to be the same ones that destroy you. 
the governments that the people were trusting are actually going to be their downfall. And within a few short years after this, Assyria does come through and wipes Israel out. Why trust on foreign military powers, God says, when all I want you to do, all God wants his people to do, is to trust him, is to trust him. Three accusations. You don't know me. You're not real with me. You don't trust me. And again, we're looking for timeless truths about God's character and human nature that come out of these poems from Hosea. And so just some concluding thoughts. Just three things that all of us, living now thousands of years later, we should remember as well. Looking at Israel and their interaction with God and Hosea's words Imagine Hosea being such a lone voice in this. There's three things I think we can pull away from this. First of all, we can clearly see that God's love for his people involves taking drastic measures to convince them to come back to their first love. God could have easily ended this covenant relationship. Sometimes you ever pretend like, if I were God, I would have probably said, you know, I can easily find an Abraham 2.0. Start all over. These people are a mess. They are a hot mess. And instead, God renews his covenant relationship with them because of his deep love and compassion for his people. God is forever faithful. He will always persistently pursue his people. There's an early 20th century pastor and theologian named Donald Barnhouse. He was actually one of the first pastors to use radio as a way to present his messages. And he has a great quote in his commentary on the book of Hosea that I think, again, this applies to us as well. The pursuing love of God is the greatest wonder in the spiritual universe. The greatest wonder is the pursuing love of God. When we see this love at work through the heart of Hosea, we may wonder, is God really like this? Good news, he is. He is. His pursuit of Israel, pulling out all the stops, trying everything he could to get their attention. Another deep truth that I think we can pull out of this passage is that God's compassion for his people just reveals the depth of his hurt. God hurts when he sees his people are unfaithful to him. You go back and look at a few places in this section, you can really see God's love for his people through some of the metaphors that he uses. Here's just a few of them. In in chapter 9, verse 10, he called Israel like grapes in the wilderness. Like grapes in the wilderness. Out in the middle of desert, nowhere, and suddenly, boom, there's a nice vine of grapes. It's a precious thing in the middle of desert and decay and destruction. In that same verse, he says, it's like, Israel, you're like an early fig in its first season. Those early figs that come maybe before we're ready, and they're they're so perfect, and and they're so satisfying, and they're so precious. Chapter 10, verse 1, God refers to Israel as a fertile vine that's yielded multiple amounts of fruit. And then my favorite one of all is in verse 11 of chapter 10, where he refers to Israel as a trained calf, a trained calf. And some people think that it may even be representing like, it's, it's like a pet calf that a family would have and how it's, you've grown attached to it, and, and you love it, and you care for it. And if dad decides it either needs to be the sacrifice or this evening's meal, and the kids are like, no, 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 you can't kill Petey, <laughs> or whatever Israeli name they gave their pet calf. That's how God views Israel. Do you see his heart breaking when these beautiful things are not with him? In fact, uh, some people have commented, some uh, commentaries have written that Hosea, there is no other biblical book like it to show us God's inner feelings. We get a deep sense of how God hurts when his people slide away. That's good for us to remember. And then finally, last thing, that's this. If we could summarize our time together this morning, I think it would look like this. Here's God's desire from his people. And this would be his people no matter where they live, in the timeline of history. 
Really, he, he wants three things from us according to this passage. First of all, God desires relationship. That's probably not new to many of us in the room, that God desires a relationship with you, and yet isn't it good to be reminded of that? Now, you may be here this morning and you're not sure about your relationship with God. And if you'd like to pursue that, we would love to talk to you afterwards. But you also may be here this morning and you recognize a relationship with God. Oh, you can remember the cozy days. You can remember snuggle time with Jesus. But things have gotten in the way. A lot of things have come along and maybe the slow, incremental moments of time have passed and you just find yourself kind of distant from Him right now. Remember that He wants relationship from you, from us. Second thing, he wants authenticity. He wants authenticity. He asked Israel to be real with him, to not allow the syncretism of life, to allow culture to invade. And even today, we would say that our role is not to hide from culture. Our role is not to let culture influence us, but instead, we're looking to redeem culture, to bring Jesus to the culture. So, authenticity Focus our attention on Him and let no one else get in our path. And the last thing is confidence. God asked Israel to trust Him. Don't rely on the Assyrias and the Egypts of the world. Trust me. And we all too, also too need to think about how can we have confidence in God? What are the Assyrias and the Egypts in your life that perhaps your giving some of your allegiance to just to cover your bases, just to make sure everything goes okay. God wants His people to know Him, to be real with Him, and to trust Him. And it doesn't take that much to slide back over. And if you need to slide back over today, and I know I need to slide back over, it doesn't take much to do that, to come back to our first love. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you. I'm just even singing this morning that you're for us, you're for us, you're for us. Thank you for that promise. Thank you for that truth. God, a uh, lot to learn from your interactions with the nation of Israel, even though it was so long ago. We can see a lot of ourselves as a people and maybe even individually in some of the accusations you made against Israel. And it's sobering to think about how easy it is to slide away, how easy it is to, to drift. And so help us to encourage one another to, to invest in each other, to encourage each other to have a relationship with you, to trust you, to be real with you. And thank you for the opportunity to be part of this church uh, where we can give all our attention to you, Jesus, and focus everything on you. Help us through our days. We love you. We pray in your name. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, I'll be up here and others. If you want to pray or talk, we'd love to have spend some time with you. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.